Thank you to everyone who's joining, whether your camera is on or off. For those of you who haven't had a chance to meet me yet, my name is Amelia Wald. I'm the executive director of the Virginia Club of New York, and we are based out of the Yale Club of New York City right next to Grand Central. But of course, we've been remote for the past couple weeks. So it has been lovely to be able to see folks from all over the country attending our events. One of the things that I love is when you ask your question, if you don't mind mentioning where it is that you're calling in from, I think that gives us a great sense of the audience. Um, and you're welcome to put your class year in as well. I know folks sometimes love to do that. It's my pleasure tonight to introduce Chris Whitehead. Chris is a PhD candidate in UVA's Corcoran Department of History. He is a 2012 grad of Dartmouth as well, um, which is also in residence at the Yale Club. So we're lucky that he has a dual connection. And Chris is, um, like I said, a PhD candidate. He's set to graduate, fingers crossed if everything goes well in 2021. And we are so <laughs> excited for him to share his research with us tonight. His research is funded by numerous grants, um, including one from the Jefferson Scholars Foundation. So it's lovely to hear that so many people are interested in the research that Chris is doing and to have him here with us tonight. And I can speak from personal experience as one of Chris's former students that he is a wonderful lecturer and a great discussion leader. And none of that has to do with the fact that he may or may not have bribed us during our Halloween class a few years ago by bringing us candy. So Chris, it's my honor to turn it over to you and feel free to take the show away. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Amelia. And for those wondering, she was an excellent student as well. So, so today's talk is called Odes Moangan al Nambaiwi, Telling History the Abenaki Way. Kwai Nidombak. In Deluizi, Glistop wombo de bot. Nuli dahon zi ayak yodali. Kiddo dami dahon zoe non gwezi ba, al non baon doa. Nawa indi glis monod wad zi. All right, so hopefully now we're all feeling a little disoriented, right? We think about the history of. New England, Northern New England, Southern Canada, we think, oh, okay, I know that place. Um, you know, maybe you think about the Red Sox playing in New England, maybe you think about small towns and leaf peeping and things like that. But I really wanna challenge that, um, these sort of assumptions or these ideas that we have about this place. But to center us just a little bit, uh, let's take a look at what I think will be a more familiar map. So this is the place that we're talking about uh, with the modern political boundaries drawn. Um, so the language that you heard me speaking is called Western Ab Abenaki or Abenaki. And that's the indigenous language of the peoples who inhabited what are now Vermont, New Hampshire, Northern Massachusetts, um, Southwestern Maine and Southern Quebec. So a, a pretty large area, but um, closely related languages would have been spoken throughout really all of New England um, and into New York east of the Hudson. West of the Hudson, you have a, a totally different language group. But um, sorry, one second here. There we go. Um, so if you lived during the colonial era, you probably would have heard the language that I was just spoken. Uh, you might have spoken it. And you certainly would have known a few words. And actually, some of you, actually really everyone on this call, knows at least two words in the Abenaki or related languages. Uh, and those are the name of states. So Massachusetts comes from Massachusetts, which means the place of the big hill, probably talking about the Blue Hills uh, near Boston. And Connecticut comes from Guanitegoc, which means uh, at the Long River. Um, Connecticut River is a very long river, starts up in Maine, goes all the way down through Connecticut. Um, so these are two place names, words that we already know. And today what I wanna do is think about these words as, um, uh, think about these words as historical documents in, in and of themselves. Uh, but first let's, let's understand this language a little bit more. So as I just said, it's called Western Abenaki or Abenaki. That's what we call it now. That's largely been assigned by historians, anthropologists, and linguists. But the people who have spoken it for centuries would call it uh, by a different name. And that is Almonbaundwaongan. The people who spoke it would have called themselves Almonbak. As we see here, these two words have uh, a very similar beginning. 
Al Nomba. So let's take a look at that and really break it down and see what it what it means. The the common gloss or sort of translation would be Abenaki people, those people of northern New England. Let's see what it means by examining the word in and of itself. So it consists of two pieces, Aum and Nomba. And if we see what this means, the Aum piece means common, usual, ordinary, but it sort of has the connotation of something that's real or genuine. And Nomba means human. So if we put these together, oh, and if I add a K, it just pluralizes it. So if we put these things together, we have Aum Nomba, the common, usual, or ordinary people with that connotation that they're the real or genuine people, meaning that those who existed on the landscape, they knew them, they spoke the same language, they lived in similar ways, their way of speaking and living was familiar to them. Unlike people from say the Iroquois or Iroquois who live in what's now New York, or eventually the settlers from France or, uh, or England who then came in and lived among them. So these are the Alnabak, the common people. So again, this is their homeland. Uh, I think it's, it's fitting that their ethnonym, the name for themselves is the common ordinary people. Uh, and I, I like that and, and I began the talk that way because one of the key purposes of studying history, in my opinion, um, is to make the familiar foreign and the foreign familiar. So these are the common people, but what do we really know about them? What we're gonna try and do is make that foreign familiar and hopefully, the familiar a little bit foreign tonight. Uh, that's what I found most exciting during my time at graduate school. And that's what I hope that we can do together for the next hour or so. So the goal of this talk, what are we gonna do? We will re-examine the piece of earth that we call New England, what we see here in this map. We'll learn a little bit about those common, usual, ordinary, real, genuine people, the Alnumbach, the Abenaki, who inhabited this place for some 12,000 years. And we'll think about the culture that sustained them during that time. So throughout the whole talk, let's keep in mind these three interrelated pieces, land, people, and culture, and especially this last concept. Let's actually dwell on this a little bit before we move on further. Um, I think it bears some initial reflection because culture, when I hear it now from the 21st century perspective, I think of the type of events that the UVA club is putting on these types of talks, maybe a musical piece, um, maybe going to a concert, maybe sipping like coffee in Paris or something like that. We think of like fancy cheeses, like that's what culture is. But uh, let's think about what culture, what, what culture might have meant 400 years ago or 4,000 years ago or 12,000 years ago when the people began inhabiting this place arrived on the land. Remember, there's no grocery store, there's no CVS, there's no Amazon Prime to get things. There's just the land and the things and the beings inhabiting or uh, that are upon it. So culture was a way of life, quite literally. It was a way of living, of staying alive, of using things and beings to stay alive. So here's the big takeaway from the talk. I'm gonna tell you up front and then hopefully everything will sort of make sense from that framework. The big takeaway is that culture evolves from the land, especially in a place like New England with a sometimes harsh and inhospitable environment. So the peoples who inhabited this land developed the ways of living aligned with it in the seasons of bounty and scarcity in their homeland. So they lived in a way that was in alignment with the land. And this isn't like a kumbaya sort of touchy feely thing. This is a literal life or death stakes of living in alignment with the land. So how did they do this? How did these people live in alignment with their land? Well, two big categories. First deal with land, the second deals with relationships and people. So on the land, they lived in seasonably mobile groups and possessed an intimate knowledge of specific pieces of land. So mobility and knowledge, we'll talk about that. And then in terms of relationships, we'll talk about the diffuse kinship networks that peoples maintained across the land. So they had people that they could turn to in times of need. We'll also talk about the careful protocols that they had for foraging and maintaining peace between interrelated peoples. Because if you were at war or at disagreements, you couldn't turn to people in time of need. So you had to have that mobility that didn't tax the land. You had to have deep knowledge of the landscape. You had to have kin 
and you had to have ways of maintaining peace. But before we render the, for the foreign familiar by examining the history on Onombaiwi, so history, the Abenaki way, uh, let's take a quick look at the more familiar production of history and see if we can't make it feel a little bit more foreign. So we inherited the map that we've had on, on screen for maps that look like this. This is an imperial map from the 1750s. Uh, and it shows uh, the imperial claims of France and Britain uh, during the period of the Seven Years' War, better known as the French and Indian War. And here you see lots of lines. So let's think about the way that a map like this would be produced. Kings on thrones in England or France would claim huge swaths of territory across an ocean. And then they would draw lines across maps and then authorize their subjects across the ocean to establish government within those lines. So here we see this blue line is French. This red line is English. We, there are some contested places here. We see the beginnings of uh, Massachusetts and Connecticut down here, beginning of what will look like New York. Maine hasn't appeared quite yet, but we see the beginning of New Hampshire. So again, this looks familiar to us, but it's kind of interesting to think just how weird a map like this really is when it's these two guys sitting across the ocean in England. Neither king had ever come to North America, but they claim it and their vested authority allows settler colonists to claim their own jurisdiction over this place. So that's kind of the history, the look of it that we're familiar with. So how is it produced? Well, it's produced by people who look a lot like this. This is Sir William Johnson, the sort of stereotypical quintessential looking colonist of the 18th century. He's an Irishman. He is a land speculator, a trader, a military official, and eventually the superintendent of military affairs for the Northern colonies. And he lived um, near Albany uh, on the present day sort of confluence of the Mohawk River and Hudson Rivers. And this is what his house looked like. It's an oil painting rendered after the fact, but this would have been like the nicest house in all of New York in the like 1740s. And here's a fairly typical um, afternoon at his house. He has a number of different leaders from, from native peoples sitting all in a circle. Um, conducting diplomacy. Of all the people in this painting, the most important one to historians is this fellow right here in the blue sitting at the table. He's not playing a terribly active role as we can see. There's a, probably a governor here or some other appointed diplomat. There's a native leader probably from the Mohawk people or another Iroquoian group um, making peace or making plans to go to war. This is important business. But for historians, it's this guy here that is actually most important because he's the scribe. He's the one writing things down. And the only way that history is really produced is by writing things down. And the words that he wrote down end up in things like this. These are the Sir William Johnson papers. So there's a whole bound version. These are actually all digitized and online. Anybody um, from your home, the same place that you're watching this talk, you can go online download Sir William Johnson's papers and read everything that he ever said to any native leaders, the diplomacy of this world. Um, but this tells really one side of the story. This is only one bit of the history of this place. How do we understand history from the perspective of people like these? These are uh, Abenaki people from an oil painting in the 18th century. How do we tell the story of the, the people that were around that council fire, people who looked like this? Now, historians try reading documents like the one that I just showed you, what we call against the grain. So they're trying to understand what the motivations of indigenous peoples would have been, trying to understand their culture, giving them what we call agency. So recognizing that they are making decisions, they're acting in their own best interests. They know what they're doing and are acting according to a but I like to think of as a cultural logic. They're not just sort of doing the bidding of these Europeans. Um, but in only relying on sources produced by Europeans, we're really limiting the view that we have into these peoples, into their culture, into their history, and then as a result, into the history of this place that we all either now live or share. Um, so really the key to starting to think about this place in a different way, in a, in a way that takes into account indigenous voices, 
So start do things like erase these boundaries that we're all really familiar with. And we see, wow, those boundaries are pretty arbitrary in some cases. Um, some boundaries follow notable rivers, um, the same ones that would have divided hunting territories for native peoples. But without anything really on this map, we start to see it in a different way and can start to imagine what life would have looked like. Um, so let's talk about these people, the Abenaki. I told you that their ethnonym, the, what they call themselves is Almanbak. So why do we call them Abenaki? Well, that's the first word that I really want to look into together. Uh, it comes from the name of this place, the name of their home, which they knew as the Don Land. So they would have called this place Wombanakiak. Again, this glosses uh, roughly translates to Don Land, but let's see sort of why, let's interrogate the actual language here. So we see it comprises a few different pieces. Wombon means literally there is whitening happening, um, which really is their word just for Don. So even though that's a noun, it's a verb, it's an active thing. Aki means land. And Iak means sort of people belonging to a citizen of in the 21st century, that's what that would mean. Um, so when we put it together, it means people belonging to the Donland or more um, concisely Donland people. In the way that they uh, conceived of their homeland looked more like this, a series of interconnected riverways that connected Villages, lakes, streams, the ocean, all the way from the Atlantic up to the St. Lawrence in Canada, through Lake Champlain, bordering um, what's now New York and Vermont. So this is what we're going to build up to today to try to see New England as this place, as Wombanaki, the Don land. And we're going to use a different set of sources than the ones that I showed you that we traditionally rely on. We're going to use this sources like this. So this is a preserved um, dictionary lexicon from probably the 1680s or so. Um, scholars are still trying to figure out the exact date of it. Produced by a Jesuit missionary uh, who went and lived among Abenaki people. Lots of these types of dictionaries survive. There are at least three from the colonial era. And then Abenaki people themselves in the 19th century have made their own grammars and dictionaries. And then communities today are still making uh, dictionaries. And I'm happy to talk about that stuff at the end and, and talk about how this language is still living and growing. So this will be the key into understanding um, these people that we're talking about. And it's also where I'm getting most of these words that I'm, that I'm sharing with you today. So how are we envisioning their world? Well, again, to look at a map produced by Europeans, they wanted to see native people in villages that resembled the ones that they were used to living in. So again, here's an orderly, very square um, village palisaded with an orderly row of houses, nice little tree there, um, an entrance. Here's another sort of little outpost. Um, permanent settled villages. That's what they expected. That's what they viewed as civilization. But for Abenaki people, life looked a lot different. Their social world looked a lot more like this. This is an oil painting from the 18th century um, of what anthropologists, historians would call a family band. This was the major social organization in, of the peoples who lived in Northern New England and Canada. So here we see two wigwam, um, which means like a bark, structure. Uh, we see a couple of families. Some, are the, some of them are hanging out here. They're making baskets, taking a little break. This little guy is causing trouble for his mom who's trying to sleep. We have somebody in there maybe making a basket, somebody starting dinner. Somebody here has caught a fish. There's another canoe out there. Here's somebody, obviously we see the penetration of European culture. He has a gun, European style hat. Their textiles are European. But in function, this group is very similar to their ancestors from thousands of years before. This family band, that's the key thing. Um, let's understand how the Abenaki people would have viewed the social world like this. What is their word for family band? Well, consulting sources like the ones that I showed you, we find this word, gasokami gwazwak, 
Again, this glosses is family banned, but there's a lot that we can learn by interrogating this word in the same way that we've been doing. So let's break it apart. Consists of several pieces and a few that are only implied in there. The, the piece gets lost, the L and the A that I have in brackets there. So this first piece in the middle there, la camille guizo, is their word for family. So we see that family band is going to, or family is going to be part of that word for family band. Let's look a little closer. What does family mean? So that first sound, that l or al, means how, as, like, in the way that, um, that that's sort of an idea. Akamig, this is a root that I want you to store away because in a few other words, we're going to see this. This is a central word, and it's very fitting that in the discussion of land, this root, um, uh, so a, a piece of a word is going to show up again and again. So it means earth, ground, space, specific territory. And even though it means land, as we'll see, it sort of carries a connotation of custom. And then this last piece, uh, this approximately means uh, the being, so an animate living being is. So a family means the being is in the way of the earth, which I think is quite beautiful. Now let's put it into context with the rest of that, that gasso and then that ending piece, ak. So gasso just means so many animate beings, so many of them together. And as I mentioned earlier, that ak is just a plural form. So let's put that whole thing together and see what we have. Gasso kami guazuak translates more literally to there are so many in the way of the earth together. So we're already learning a lot more than just family band. But we have to do some thinking, right? So there are so many in the way of the earth together. It's a beautiful sentiment. But what does it mean to be in the way of the earth? This is what's going to connect us to that idea of land and culture being really intertwined concepts. Because this family exists and supports itself. And these family bands exist and support other families by operating within the, const the constraints of the world that they inhabit. So to answer the question of what does it mean to live in the way of Earth, this specific piece of territory that they live on, let's go back to the beginning of the Abenaki world and introduce you to a new character. So this is Odzi Hodzo. He sits currently in Lake Champlain, about a mile off the coast of present day Burlington. And Odzi Hodzo means he made himself because according to Abenaki oral tradition, he created his own body from the rocky earth around him. In his massive hands, he collected sand, and he pulled them together and that made mountains. In lacking legs, he stretched out his arms and he gripped mountains and he sort of just pulled himself across the land, carving rivers, streams, and ponds. To make lakes, he dug himself deeper. He sort of pivoted down in the way that, you know, you might pivot your, your foot in the sand at the beach or something like that. Uh, and he ground down the, the earth beneath him. And he traveled all across that place that we now know as New England, shaping the world to make it habitable for the Abenaki people. And in his final act, he created Lake Champlain. Um, this is a central place in the Western Abenaki sort of spiritual world. And because of its beauty, he said, wow, this is a great sort of final resting place. I'll turn myself back into stone here and I'll sit here forever. And for centuries after that, um, the ancestors of Abenaki people, whenever they would pass by this, it's a very small island, but they would stop, burn some tobacco as an offering to thank him for creating the world that gave them all the things that they needed to survive. So Western science probably doesn't talk about Ozi Hozo, but it has a very similar explanation for the transformation of what is now New England. And that is the recession of the last glacial ice sheet around 12,000 years ago. So the first inhabitants of this place arrived as the last ice sheet of the ice age was receding back up towards Canada. Like Ojihozo, the glacial, the glacier dragged itself, right? So it, as it was melting back, it had the, the look of, of dragging itself backwards. As it melted, it deposited huge stones, boulders, glacial till that had um, collected within the ice. It created and then drained massive reservoirs, which became rivers and lakes, including Lake Champlain, which began as part of the Atlantic Ocean. It was a, a sea for about a thousand years. Um, 
And then it left behind a world that looks very different than the New England that most of us would, would recognize. It looked like a um, vast, grassy, and open tundra. And the first beings to exploit that, that open tundra were what we call megafauna, so mastodon, which sort of looked like woolly mammoth, um, huge moose elk. So think about the moose that we have now and then sort of double the size of that, these, these massive um, animals. And the first people showed up, um, kind of came up the Champlain Valley, following these animals to, to hunt them. So their society looked a lot like this. This is obviously a painting done in the contemporary era. Um, but it shows what life would have looked like um, about 12,000 to 9,000 years ago. So these ancestors of Abenaki arrived following these herds. Uh, and even though there was some gathering that they could do, some roots, some plants they could eat, they mostly relied on the protein, the fat, the vitamins that they could get from these animal species that they followed. And although we don't know the language that these people spoke, it was related, it was a, you know, an early ancestor of the language that still exists. We don't know the, the word that existed for them, but we see this idea of family bands, this gasokami kwezuak, these related families, people living in the way of the earth. We see multiple families who are living in, and traveling together um, across the earth. And as we see, it's, it's pretty small and it's pretty mobile. And this is important because it helped to ensure sort of naturally that these people were living within the constraints of the land. They weren't over hunting it um, because if they over hunted it, then they wouldn't have anything to eat and they wouldn't survive individually or as a people. It was also a very fluid kinship system. Um, when people sort of, there was not marriage in the way that we would think of it, but um, when people got together to have like a, a baby, they would, they could either join the man or the woman's, uh, their families, Gaso Kami Gwezwak. And because of that, they had kinship dispersed, uh, they had kin dispersed across the landscape. And so they might've been hunting, you know, a hundred miles away or something like that. Um, and maybe coming together seasonally. But because of that, if this one group say, you know, for whatever reason, their, their hunt was unsuccessful, people, individual families could peel off and go to a different group. So it, we sort of see that early safety net of um, the social system that developed. And if they had overhunted, people could peel off, go with their, another related family um, in, a, in a different band and then allow the environment to sort of replenish itself and make their own territories um, hospitable for them again. So it's this sort of natural way of living that is in alignment with the land always ebbing and always flowing. So this is what life would have been like for about 3000 years from the period 12,000 years ago to 9,000 years ago. And during that time, the world was changing as it always does. The climate is warming as the ice age is drawing to a close. But subsequent generations, these people's descendants, adapted this fluid kinship system to a changing landscape. So from 9,000 years ago to about 3,000 years ago, the landscape is changing dramatically. This is again, just a rendering. Um, but we can see that there are trees here, like larger trees, there are forests growing, more recognizably New England. By the end of this period, it would have looked a lot like the places in New Hampshire, Vermont, Maine that we would see today. Um, the forest grew up, as I said, where there was tundra. And so these, these large megafauna, the mastodon, the moose elk, they're dying off because they don't have that same place to graze. As they die off, these people need to figure out how do we survive on this earth? They don't completely abandon everything that has allowed their ancestors to survive for thousands of years, but they take that and they adapt it. And so they're still traveling seasonally. Remember, that's one of those key things that we're talking about. And they're st still traveling in family bands. They still have relatives and other family bands, but they're adopting a more diverse diet. As we can see here, people are uh, making nets and stone fishing weirs so that they can take advantage of the fish uh, as the spring ice melts. In the spring, women would also be gathering um, in, you know, this is some wild plant species. They would have been gathering berries and nuts and roots, um, seeds, things like that. In the fall, they would have exploited the populations of smaller mammals. So things like deer or fox, minks, 
um, wolverines that lived in the forests, uh, turkeys as well. And they would have begun altering the land that they lived in. So deer thrive in sort of transition zones like this here, the edge of the field and the forest. And so people would have begun burning back some of the undergrowth to promote greater deer herds. And so they would have had this sort of cyclical movement of, you know, in the spring, take advantage of the fishing, take advantage of the gathering, in the fall, take advantage of the hunting. And because of this, they would have um, over, you know, hundreds of years come together into these um, places that became recognizable as villages. Um, because these subsistence activities support a population increase, allowing multiple family bands to inhabit the same place during warmer months. And here, as we see, they would gather and, and share in the work of just the day-to-day -day elements of living, making canoes, making mats. They would have dried fish together. They would have hunted together. Um, and these gradually became seasonal villages. So let's take a look at another word. As, as we think about these people identifying a or coming together with a sense of a shared identity. Let's look and see what in the Abnaki language what that would have looked like. So this is a word that was recorded by a Jesuit priest uh, living among the Abenaki in Maine during the 1690s. He was asking for their approximation of a word like nation. Um, and the word that uh, the people told him was Again, we can mine this for its meaning by breaking it down. Ingwed means one, akamig. Again, that's the same root that we saw, which means earth, ground, or space. We know person, and again, that ak pluralizes it. So all together, when asked for their idea of a nation, people assembled together in a village during the warmer months, they would have said, ingwedakwamigwenuak, sorry. Uh, which means one earth people. Again, another sort of beautiful sentiment of uh, one earth people, people who share the same resources from the earth in the same way of traveling across it, um, coming together for uh, in, in the warmer months um, to you know, share in the, in the everyday work of living. But cold months still posed a threat. As anybody who's been to New England in the wintertime knows, it gets cold, it gets icy. Um, there's not a lot to rely on to eat in terms of vegetation. Uh, hunting becomes harder as animals hibernate. And so just like their ancestors from 12,000 years ago, the people who were inhabiting New England, you know, a thousand years ago, 2000 years ago, are still moving um, along the earth to maintain their own population in alignment with it. So as the warm weather draws to a close and fall um, hunting is done, individual families disperse from villages into their own hunting territories, hunting things like this, moose. And they've you know, used snowshoes here. So the moose sink down um, into the snow. They're using the snowshoes to gain an advantage uh, in, in the hunting. So again, we see that culture doesn't change entirely, it just sort of morphs. Um, so we go from people traveling all the time over land to people traveling for some of the season across um, their hunting, their fishing, their gathering territories, and then dispersing into um, hunting territories for family bands in the winter where fewer people will demand fewer resources. Then a thousand years ago or so, we get another major innovation and this is Horticulture. Corn appears for the first time in Northern New England about a thousand years ago. But this doesn't change really all that much. Um, it certainly becomes an important part of these people's diet. But again, they don't throw out everything that worked for their ancestors because it continues to work for them. So in the same seasonal spots where there were villages where women would have been gathering the seeds and the berries and the nuts, they're now tending to um, corn and squash and beans. So it's really just an augmentation rather than a replacement. And they need to maintain the same safeguards in terms of seasonal movement, in terms of having kin in related um, villages uh, spread all across the Donland. 
because as anybody who, again, who lives in New England, it's an unpredictable place where the growing season can be perilously short. So the cultivar of corn that these women, again, this is an oil painting, but the cultivar of corn that um, New England people grew was probably a 12 row flint corn, which took about 90 days to mature from seedling to you know, harvestable ear of, of corn. And only some of the Donland was able to um, facilitate that or support that horticulture. So here's a, an approximate map where if we overlay growing seasons onto the Donland, we can see the viability of, of horticulture. So these are all, all these dots here are villages. And as we can see, they're sort of concentrated in this band. And if we look at this key here, this is where they could re reliably have about 95 to 98 days within a growing season, a company, and that accounts for planting a little bit later um, than the last spring frost, just in case there was another one that came sort of abnormally late and accounted for, you know, a couple of weeks buffer at the end of the season, uh, just in case there was an early killing frost. Um, so we see that the place where these people decided to live was in alignment with the land. And if we really think back, like these people didn't have GIS, they didn't have satellite images to see where frost lines would occur. This was through trial and error of where they created a village. Um, and as we see from the other resources that were available to them, these were strategically located as a place where they could reliably grow corn. But then if we look at the population density of deer around them, the yellow is a greater density than the green and the orange is a greater density than the yellow. They were also at the edge of the most productive deer hunting territories and at the edge of productive moose hunting territories. So these people have organized and set up these villages um, such that they were exploiting all of the resources available to them. So again, following that pattern, gathering together for planting in the spring, summer, and fall, disbanding in the winter. And we see this dynamic still in effect when the first French people came and made contact with the Abenaki in what's now the Kennebec Valley of Maine. So I'll read from you a quote from uh, Samuel de Champlain, or Champlain from July 1629, when he sent uh, his brother-in-law to go and make contact with these people he had heard about the Abenaki. So when his brother-in-law returned, he had this to report. He assured us that all those tribes wished to form a close friendship with us and were prepared to take our men and feed them through the winter until such time as we should obtain relief through the arrival of our vessels. And then in a few days, a chief would come from these tribes with some canoes to confirm their friendship and even to aid us with their Indian corn. For they have large villages and also houses in the country with many stretches of cleared land in which they sow much Indian corn and from which they harvest a sufficient quantity for their own maintenance. And also to enable them to assist their neighbors when there is a scarcity in a year that is poorer than usual. So again, we see these same dynamics in effect, establishing friendships and alliances, taking friends in during the winter to sort of spread out the population of people, sharing resources. So this is the type of activity that we, again, we saw at the beginning of um, a council meeting, we would say. But in the context of what we just saw of, of making friendships, let's look at one last word here and understand what that process meant to these people. Um, so this, this word, alangodwangan, means peace. It means alliance. It means kin. It's the same sort of word. And again, we can break it down. All, we've seen that word before. Logo means relation, being related. Duangan means by speaking. So by putting this together, their word for alliance and peace means the way of being related by speaking. So although, you know, for the people in, you know, at that treaty council that we saw, the piece of paper was the final product. For the people, for the indigenous people who were the participants in it, it was that ritual of coming together to speak, to forge these alliances, to maintain peace, to ensure that they had relations in you know distant or of villages over over multiple miles that they could then rely on i'll end on this i think this is a really good way to pull together a lot of the concepts that we're talking about 
these are the moons that um, Abenaki people used to mark time. They correspond roughly with our months, although we have a solar calendar. Most indigenous people had a lunar calendar. Um, and I just wanna point out a couple of, of things here. So we see a lot of um, uh, moons in what we would call the summer are about uh, resources. So the blueberry maker, when blueberries are ripe, the corn maker, they know when corn is ripe, ice hunting moon, that is when people are hunting things like uh, beaver by sort of walking over the ice. What we call March the moose hunter moon, that's when people are hunting moose. My favorite one is what we would call January. So after Gwini Kizos, the long moon, there's Anhal Damawi Kizos, which means forgive me moon. And that is when people would have traveled around to villages, visiting with their kin, sharing whatever um, foodstuffs they had with villagers and apologizing for any wrong that they had done. And I think I like this word because it, it sums up a lot of the things that we're talking about. There is this mobility that is a fixture of life for these people in the North. They have to move to survive to catch their food, but they also have to move to survive to maintain the relationships with people. Um, and I think that this really encapsulates the idea that I wanna impart here with you all. Um, and I think this is a good place to end. So I will say, I'll skip a couple of slides and I will say Ulioni, which is thank you, literally good encircling. And I'll just put up in the background a couple of resources for people. If you're interested in the words that I've been saying here, the language, there is a vibrant community of people who are better speakers than I am, who have studied far longer than I have this language. Um, WesternAbenaki.com is run by um, a very able linguist and Abenaki man himself, Jesse Bruchak. Um, there's a vibrant Facebook community. If you just put search Western Abenaki, that's a good place to become part of the community and learn about the culture that is still ongoing, the people who are reclaiming their language um, and learning what the world of their ancestors looked like. So with that, I will, uh, I'll end and I'll gladly take questions or talk about anything that is interesting to all of you. Thanks so much. Chris, thank you so much. That was a fantastic lecture. I too was struck by the beauty of the Abenaki language. It looks like they have nothing on, or. French has nothing on Western Abenaki. And we did fortunately have a couple questions come in in advance. I would love to answer those questions first. And then as you folks have questions that come to mind, feel free to put them in the chat or you can raise your hand via Zoom as well. So our first question um, is if you know of any monuments um, or spaces honoring the Abenaki people in New England um, or in other areas that they've lived for that matter. Um, so there are a few monuments to Abenaki people. Probably the most notable one is in Burlington, sort of overlooking the harbor. That is a um, large statue, a totem pole of an Abenaki chief from the 18th century named Greylock. And that's where we get the name of the mountain in Massachusetts, Western Massachusetts, Mount Greylock, who was tightly allied with the French and was sort of the nightmare of English settlers in uh, his former homeland in, in Northwestern Massachusetts. Um, it doesn't bear any of his actual likeness, but I think in the 1970s, an artist traveled around to every state in the country and made a sort of statue totem pole in honor of the indigenous peoples of those places. Um, there are some markers throughout like highways and things like that. Um, that uh, mark places, but I think that the Greylock statue is, is probably the best. And he's, I think, a point of pride in the Abenaki community. And his last name, Wawanaloet, means he who throws others off the tracks. Um, his ancestor, or his descendant, Cecile Wawanaloet, was one of the key people in the 1990s to real, really start revitalizing the Abenaki language as people who had spoken that as their first language began dying off. She began this push. So they're both leaders in their own right and I think a fitting monument to them. Thanks for that question. Thank you. And then another question is, what sparked your interest in this subject? If you could speak a little bit more about your personal investment. Oh, sure. Well, um, I grew up in, in Massachusetts. I, although I'm, I'm sort of broadcasting here from Charlottesville, I consider myself a New Englander. I grew up in Massachusetts. As you mentioned, I did my undergrad in, uh, uh, in New Hampshire. 
So I spent most of my life there. I spent summers in New Hampshire on a small lake with my grandmother. Um, I think for me, the language was a big part of it, just wanting to understand, you know, why is Massachusetts named what it is? Why is Lake Sunapee named what it is? And then also, um, you know, going to, to school at Dartmouth, it was founded in part as a school for native peoples. And most of the early um, native scholars were Abenaki people. So there is that strong presence there. And my advisor as an undergrad did a lot of work um, on and with Abenaki people. And as I got later into college and then began a career in you know, finance, I found that as I moved to smaller and smaller apartments, and had less and less room for books. The books that seemed to make it were the ones on the history of Native New England. And I thought, well, I should do this uh, for a career, so. I think that's a fascinating way uh, to analyze your passions because as someone who also lives in a very small Manhattan apartment, I can definitely sympathize with that. Um, another question is, what does decolonization mean to you as you engage in research on indigenous peoples as a non-indigenous scholar? That's a good question. Um, and it's probably something that I need to think more about because there are people that this is what they study and 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 do and then activate um, you know how how to actively be you know a presence of decolonization. For me, in my own work as a historian, the way that I think about that is trying to diversify the sources that I use away from or in in partnership to complement the sort of corpus that most scholars of this area and this place use, those ones that I sort of began the talk um, showing. Um, and by understanding that the language, you know, not only is it written down in these, these manuscripts that thankfully survived hundreds of years, but each generation that these words are passed down to me is the same as, you know, a book that's passed down or, or is available in the library. And doing the work of trying to learn this language and understand the culture embedded within it. Um, I think it's also just brought in my own mind and, and scholarly experience. And one of my favorite things is I'm in an you know, Abenaki class right now that meets virtually. And there are some people who are Abenaki, um, some people who just live in the area and are interested in learning more about their culture. And that's been a really great learning experience to just engage with those people and, and, learn, and come together to learn and preserve a language. I think for me that that's what I'm probably best suited to do. Um, but for those who are interested in this type of, of work, I think the best thing is to, to learn about the, the peoples and the organizations near, near you and, and understand what they're doing and, and what the needs are. Thank you, that was a very, very thoughtful answer. Um, some, we have, like I said, folks calling in from all over and one person um, lives near, I might be pronouncing this right, Cohoes Falls. Um, mm. She was wondering if you're familiar with the area and what um, role that area plays in the Abenaki story. Sure, so I believe um, that those falls are, are really right at the, where the Mohawk River and the Hudson River meet. Um, if I'm not mistaken. It's kind of confusing because there is an Abenaki village called Koas. It's a different meaning. Um, and that mean, Koas means uh, little pine tree. Kohos Falls comes from a Mohawk word, which I'm not as, as versed in. Um, that's why, remember I said east of the Hudson, people would have sounded a lot like the language that I'm speaking. West of the Hudson, all bets are off because that's a totally different language group and a completely different culture group. They didn't move seasonally. They didn't speak the language that I had said. They had much larger permanent se um, settlements that resembled sort of the villages that, that Europeans lived in. You know, thousands of people living in, in one village. Those are, you know, the Mohawk, the Iroquois, um, or the Ganyan Gehaga is the, is the word that Mohawk people would call themselves. Um, but Abenaki people were certainly traveling on the Hudson River. Um, and there was a, a community just north of that in what's now um, Shattuck, New York, right on the border of, of Western Massachusetts, that was formed as a sort of refugee village after um, a major war in Massachusetts that's most often called King Philip's War, um, although it's really a series of, of 
wars of, of native resistance and then sort of just embroilment in colonial wars. And that was kind of a mixing place of Mohawk and Abenaki and other uh, Algonquian speakers. That's the major language family that, that I was speaking there. Um, uh, so it, although Kohos doesn't play like necessarily a specific Abenaki story, it was certainly a, a central place um, in, that, in that region. There's a, a very rich culture. And, I, and I'll say nowadays in, in the present, there's a, a large native population of Abenaki people in places like Saratoga. There's a, um, a powwow there every year um, put on by Abenaki people. Um, so, so, you know, it, it just shows that history is ongoing. So it actually plays now probably as great a role as it did in the colonial era, which is where I specialize. Thank you. And then speaking about um, the broader upstate counties of New York, one of our attendees was wondering if you could maybe speak a little bit more about um, European colonization in that area and, and what occurred as Europeans began interacting with other, you know, the Abenaki and other native tribes there. Sure. So, um, so in upstate New York, uh, I guess it depends on, <laughs> I feel like everyone north of like White Plains says that they're in upstate New York, but um, let's consider upstate New York like Albany and points sort of north and west. That gets into the territory that most people would know as the Iroquois, um, it probably was pronounced Iroquois back then. The name that those people would have known themselves by is, is Haudenosaunee um, or Rotinosone in the in Ghani and Geha, which is the Mohawk language, which means like they build the longhouse. So they're the people of the longhouse. So that is the Seneca people to the very far west. They consider themselves a keeper of the Western doors to the Mohawk people in what's now sort of the Albany area, the keepers of the Eastern door. The Onondaga in the center, um, they kept a center council fire. Um, and then you had the um, Oneida sort of between them and then the Cayuga. And then in the 1720s, you had the Tuscarora, who are another Iroquoian speaking people migrate up from the Carolina area and um, became a member of the, the Iroquois Confederacy as it's, it's often known. So they have a totally different but related history. And actually th that's what my dissertation is about is the interaction of native peoples between these two worlds. So the, the indigenous, the Abenaki name for Lake Champlain is Pitabag, which literally translates to the between lake because it served as a boundary waters between these two people. But it was also a place of contested European um, colonization. That early map that I showed you, there was like this little wedge that came down and it said, this place is contested, um, claimed by the French, but it's, it's ours, it was a British map. And that's right on the, the Lake Champlain Valley. So there was you know, contact with the French in 1609. There was also contact with the Dutch in 1609. And because of the importance of this region, this upstate New York region, especially then connecting Lake Ontario, which connected the fur trade with the upper Great Lakes area, um, they couldn't really just dispossess natives in the same way that we think about um, you know, places west of the Mississippi or even in, in the Southeast because they were for a long time numerically superior they rely, Europeans relied on them as allies um, to fight in their imperial wars. Um, and so they had to make treaties for most of the colonial era. That said, during the 18th century, the population influx of mostly British colonists continually pressing up into the Mohawk River did dispossess people. Land deeds oftentimes were signed fraudulently or they would get somebody, you know, a native sachem drunk and then they would sign something or they would cross out, you know, the amount of land that the person signed away and then add, you know, another few thousand acres. So there was some combination of, um, in the spectrum of coercion, it wasn't certainly the most that we've seen in the history of, of native peoples in this land, but it wasn't all always peaceful. Um, and things changed really then after the American Revolution uh, where most people fleeing from the Mohawk Valley and, and places like that fled to Canada. And the first Americans then used that as an opportunity to really take that, that land, even though you know, movement between villages was, was very common as I sort of had been pointing out here. And in 1784, the second treaty of Fort Stanwix in what's now Rome, New York 
took a very different tack from all previous um, negotiation with native people, which really did treat them as sort of their own sovereign groups. And they said, you are a conquered people. We have conquered you through war. Your land is ours. Um, the United States Army couldn't defend that claim with the strength of its military. Um, they backed off on that and went back to making treaties. But that 1784 period really serves as an inflection point in, in all of sort of Indian history, but then especially in that upstate New York region um, where it was seen as they were more like, um, oh, sorry, more inhabitants than, than owners of the land. A really great book um, if you want to understand how this, like the different stages of, of colonization in the United States, I'd recommend reading um, How the Indians Lost Their Land. It's very readable and it shows that whole spectrum of sort of cooperation to coercion to specific military force because there is no one answer of, of how it was that Europeans and then Americans came to acquire an entire continent, so. Thank you. And in your talk, you you often brought up the idea of this sense of belonging, um, the belonging mm. of the Abenaki people to the land, to each other. And one of our participants was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about um, the sense of belonging to the land and a group of people that are still moving around within an area, as well as a sense of belonging to each other within the kinship structures you mentioned. Sure. So again, I'm, a, I'm not a native person, so I can't answer from my own, you know, first person experience. And there are, um, you know, Native people that for them, kinship still is the, the dominant force in their life. It is a web of relationships that helps you understand and really assigns to you a reciprocal obligation and right. So what do you owe to other people and what do other people owe to you? Um, that's as near as I've you know, been able to sort of understand it at a, at a personal level. I can sort of speak from the, the academic level. I think that the quote from Champlain's brother-in-law in 1629 helped me to understand and put into context these words that I had been seeing, which is why I really like the approach of complementing sort of the traditional sources with um, sources from environmental data, from linguistic data, from oral tradition, because we see that they could, neighboring villages could expect corn if their harvest didn't pan out. They could send families to go live with other traveling bands if their you know, leaders died of disease or they, they were facing a tough time or something like that. Um, Again, this was a matter of life and death situation. It wasn't just, oh, it's nice to have some extra corn. It's where do we turn to now? There's again, no grocery store, obviously. Um, so it's an interesting thing of like, what can you rely on from your kin? Then the other part of the question is that sense of belonging. Something that I had in an earlier draft of this, but I took out because it got so sort of in the, in the weeds even more than, than we were today was looking at the variation of when people could expect frost in the part of the world that they lived in. So if you remember that map that I showed, um, it had sort of one big uh, like band across it where most villages were. Even within that, there was a lot of diversity. So the time when, when women would have planted in a village in the Kennebec Valley uh, would have been maybe a month or so different than the people who lived in the Champlain Valley. And so what really fascinated me is this question of how did these women know? They were operating on a lunar cycle. So they had these words that, that marked time, um, but they would have had to have kept track of sort of the, the deviation of how that lunar calendar aligned with like what we now think of it as a calendar because a lunar calendar shifts, um, it's not, it's not totally precise, but they would have known just by trial and error and then passing that knowledge down to their own descendants. So mothers would have taught daughters that this is the time, these are the signs that we would see where we know that it's safe now to plant. Because if they didn't time it well, then their whole village would face starvation if they didn't then have kin. So I think that that like hopefully gives a nice example of this idea of belonging, this deep familiarity with what it takes to survive 
in this land and how one's identity as a person from this specific piece of earth um, really is, is the matter of, of staying alive. Thank you so much for um, taking the time to speak with us about your research, taking the time to answer our questions. I know that it was wonderful for me to hear you speak as a former student uh, and see you highlighting your own research as opposed to someone else's lesson plan. Um, so I think that was wonderful. And we really do wish you the best of luck as you finish up your dissertation and um, an early career scholar. We're lucky that we were able to, to bring you in before you get all rich and famous on us. Oh, yes. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. And I see that there are some other questions coming in and things. If, if anybody has other questions, I'm happy to respond over email. Um, you can look me up just if you go to UVA's um, like history department and then you cl click on the people. Um, I'm the same Chris Whitehead that's, that's listed there. Um, so please feel free to reach out. I love talking about this stuff. Um, so thanks again. Yeah, thank you so much. And those resources that you shared on your last slide and any other resources you'd like to share with the audience, I'm happy to email those out to everyone after the fact for anyone who wants to do some supplementary reading, if you have space on your bookshelf and don't live in a small Manhattan <laughs> apartment. So thank you everyone so much tonight. Thank you, Chris. Thank you everyone for joining us. We hope you have a great night and we will see you at another event soon. Have a good night, y'all. <laughs>